today, right, we have the question of the strange labor in the 1844 manuscripts and then heading towards Lukács and the chapter on reification. What was the reading before this? Mm. Before that? Marx. Gramsci. The Gramsci, yeah. Philosophical essay on philosophy. And then you did oh, the... Oh, the Everyone's a Philosopher. That can we talk yeah. a little bit about s selections from the modern prince, the elements of politics? Okay. okay. Question of organization, of party. Interval state. The challenges of, 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 you know, the nature of authority. Is authority is, is some kind of an oppressive relationship, political relationship, inherently part of human nature, or is it... So then, particular Michael put this in to tie into the Lukács. Right. So this comes first, and then Lukács follows, okay. uh, and then with the Hegel, Marx's critique right. of Hegel. Yeah, this is a very, obviously it's a very important uh, uh, concept, this idea of alienation and commodity fetishism, for a number of reasons. But I, from what I've just heard, obviously, uh, Michael wants to tie it into this question of organization and politics. And look at his position in that sense as in partly derived from the experience of Lenin and the October Revolution, but also departing from uh, uh, the young Marx, is that a, a vanguardist, in a sense, political party is necessary because commodity, the, the, the commodity fetishism reification uh, makes it impossible for the working class by itself to come to a level of class consciousness. That you need the ideas, the concepts. You need to, to read and to be educated, to be capable of going beyond the lived experience of reification to achieve that revolutionary uh, subjectivity. So that's why many people uh, uh, consider the, 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 this, you know, Lukács, of course, himself changed his, he renounced this book later on in life. But, uh, this is by many considered to be the theoretical uh, uh, companion to the practical application of Leninism, this is sort of the theory of Leninism after the fact, in a sense. Uh, but there's another interesting question, though, that, that I think the early essays of Marx raise, which is, um, you know, maybe a question more of, of uh, sort of what is revolutionary Marxist thought himself, right? And there are many things, but, um, and even in the early essays, like the exchange uh, labor essay, we see the revolution in thinking that Marx's ideas are, are sort of starting to have um, in politics, right? And I think, I think sort of, I wanted to, I was thinking about this and I, maybe, I, maybe I was gonna like spend a few minutes to sort of try to present like in what way Marx was a revolution in thought, because that's another important element of, of him. And in certain ways, opening the ways for uh, anti-liberal politics you know, in the 19th and 20th century, and hopefully in the 21st century. So um, maybe I can just do this like for five minutes, and yeah. then we can go back to where you're yeah. starting. Yeah. So <coughs> the, um, you, know, the con you know, Marx was a person of the 19th century, so uh, European uh, politics, and which means that he, they're all living in the shadow of the French Revolution, right? And the French Revolution um, unleashed the major, um, some other thinkers have called them epochal defining change, which was, um, when, you th when you think about politics, you know, what is, the, what is the basis upon which you make sense of the world and thus proceed politically, socially, collectively, to, to live your life and make sense of it? And until Marx, I would propose following other, you know, this kind of familiar line of thinking that that uh, until Marx, there was no clarity on this question in the sense that Marx's ideas about and explanations about politics changed and shifted uh, the origin, you know, the fundamental first principles upon which people base their politics, right, in his world. So until, and this is sort of, of course, the, uh, the background to um, Marx's critique of Hegel and all the other philosophy that came before it, and, and the s s statement that philosophy must must end, you know, only to be recreated anew. So, basically, what he was saying early on, and it's kind of striking to see this in the first essays as well, with his focus on the on on on, on labor, and and the, and the fundamental role that it plays in 
in us actually be becoming human or being human is that uh, Marx denies the, the tradition of, 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 of political philosophy before, or philosophy in general uh, that surrounded him, that was perhaps, you know, whether it's Kantian or Hegelian even, uh, and basing his sort of beliefs on uh, the influence exerted upon him by early Greek thinkers, Aristotle, but also before Aristotle, and thinkers like Spinoza, uh, Marx actually shifts the origin, the first principles upon which uh, we, you know, he thinks about the political and everything that derives from it. So, for example, when he says uh, that even Hegel, in his great systems of thought, uh, ultimately sort of, you know, there is a first principle in, in, in effect in the mature works of Hegel, and that you could say that's God. Uh, whether it's called God or not, whether it has a different name, uh, there's still some kind of a fundamental metaphysical entity that we try to reach as our... Um, path of full realization. There's a truth, you know, in that sense. Uh, the same thing with Kant's reason uh, sort of plays uh, some kind of a metaphysical role. Um, Plato certainly, uh, differently from Aristotle, would have this notion of the truth and this kind of meta me metaphysical first principle that we may have access to, but it's beyond us. And it's sort of, it, it's the big challenge of life as we live a life of wisdom and we reach our full potential uh, in the good life. So I think with Marx, there's a revolution in the sense that may, maybe we can't say he's the first thinker who did this, but, but it's very clear with him that he basically says there is no one origin. There is no one metaphysical first principle that we base our thinking and, and our very notions of, of making sense of the world. There is no God. Um, and, and, and in that, of course, he is a complementary uh, thinker. They're mutually complementary with Nietzsche, right, in the 19th century. And, uh, I guess they never really read each other's work, right, as far as we know. Well, for sure, Marx didn't read. For yeah. Marx didn't read Nietzsche, and Nietzsche doesn't seem to have read Marx, but they kind of, we have this current in 19th century thought that it rejects the, the centuries-old notion of first principles, whether, wh which are essentially metaphysical, right? And he says there is no God, there is no authority like the church, there are no some higher ethical considerations that, or moral con considerations that lead to there are no timeless, even, you know, in, in more scientific language of the night. There are no modern, there are no some eternal evolutionary truths that are sort of um, unchanged and form the, the anchor, you know, to which we always return. There is, of course, death. So he doesn't go there, but other thinkers go there, like Heidegger, right? The fundamental contradiction in us for Heidegger is uh, the fact that we all know we're going to die, so we're finite, but yet we have the ability to... Um, um, to experience the world in, 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 in multiple levels and layers of complexity, right? So we don't just exist, and we, we're not just satisfied by saying, I exist, I'm a human being, you know, I'm a good person, or whatever. That's not enough, right? So Heidegger would say that's the ontic level of life, the fixed object that is, which, of course, you can say that's what capitalism reduces many people to, right? The notion of... Somebody else has said the bare life, you know, Agamben, we mentioned Agamben, like the idea that you're reduced to just a survivor in the concentration camp. It's a very nice concentration camp compared to the concentration camp in World War II, but, but it is a camp without walls, but it is a camp, and you're reduced to your functioning daily to that condition. I think a lot of this stuff was, was present in Marx as well, in specifically in this essay, but he doesn't talk about the, the movement towards death, you know, which, is, which forms the other existential crisis. Um, so, so I think with Marx we have a revolution in thinking whereby the single origin is rejected, metaphysics are rejected as foundationally important, uh, and they're replaced simply by, simply, they're replaced by the human being ta taking a center stage. Uh, the human being takes a, a center stage and thus we have Marxist materialism you know, as the fun foundational philosophical move. It is a philosophy, but it's a completely new philosophy, right? I mean, he's not, there are other materialists before him, but it, with Marx, we have this total uh, displacement of the metaphysical single uh, s initial principles, originary principles that give the starting point for us to be able to make sense of the world. With Marx, these principles are displaced, they're made fun of, they're criticized, they're rejected, and they're replaced with a new, essentially an ontology. You know, they're replaced with uh, uh, an ontology centered on the human being. 
And this is, the, this is where the famous sentence in the Communist Manifesto a few years after this essay comes, where all history that is known to us so far is the history of human to human relations that are conditioned through power in specific ways, class struggle. Um, we may have metaphysical uh, urges and explanations, but, uh, and they're allowed, of course, to, to help us wage the class struggle, but they're not originary, they're not primary. They, they cannot function, and they should not function as sort of some kind of a truth that, that gives special illumination about our lives. You know, there are other uh, ways that we ground ourselves as beings in the world. And, I, and this is a huge um, change in, in philosophy per se, or Western philosophy at least. Um, and it is connected to liberal politics. I mean, there is a certain influence of uh, liberal philosophy, although all the great figures of liberal philosophy before Marx defer to God one way or another, right? Even Hobbes, Hobbes was not really, right? There's Hobbes was an atheist. He was an There's atheist. No, yeah. So he paid lip service to God as a first principle, but, but Hobbes... And our friend John Locke. Uh, has a nice book, I don't yeah. know if you ever read it, The Reasonableness of Christianity. No. And, uh, and Locke says, uh, Christianity is good because the many are too stupid to understand it. So let them believe. So, so I mean, that to yeah. the degree that they're theists, not that, I, that would make Jefferson them any, any better, yeah. obviously, you know. But there was... But, you know, <laughs> that should be taken with a grain of salt. But there were precedents to Marx's radical sort of displacement of, of philosophy based on metaphysical first principles in some of these liberal thinkers. So this was the, you know, the events of the French Revolution as well. It's just that with Marx, things became more radicalized in that way. The, the displacement was more permanent. Um, no, you know, but, but even in Locke or uh, uh, Hobbes, you do have first principles. You do have first yeah, principles. And it has to do with, yeah. uh, with the question of human nature. Mm -hmm. So they're eminently the state humanist. of nature. And yes, yeah. they're eminently yeah. humanist. Uh, yeah. um, yeah. Humanists in terms of their philosophical underpinnings. Right. And, and as is... Marks here in some ways too. We can discuss right. that, but this is still the, and the then humanist marks. The humanist marks, but then there's another complexity here when he, um, you know, because the third essay that Michael's going to get into is his critique of Hegel, because in the early Marx, probably because he was a like a young person who just finished his PhD and, and he was kind of started in this was what 25 years old. Yeah, in his left Hegelian kind of moment, because you know Hegel, the great figure of, of of 19th century philosophy, he could be read, uh, you know, on the left politically, like Lukács does. He uses words from Hegel's logic, you know, the, the, the particular and the universal that play a very important role in the way reification functions. Um, reific in other words, <coughs> cap re refi uh, the reified relations, the, the objectification of human to human relations and their transference to object to object relations only become problematic if they're generalized. You know, if they function on the level of the general rather than the particular or the specific. So this is like literally uh, the three major categories of Hegel's science of logic. Um, so, so Marx is dismissive, sympathetic, kind of respectfully dismissive of, of <laughs> Hegel's uh, still metaphysical grounding of his system. Um, and, it, you know, the very concept that he uses, essence, universal, self-alienation, um, and he says, you know, we also have to abandon Hegel's uh, system as well as, as still being reliant on metaphysical origins. But interestingly, in the, uh, I think it's the second preface to the, or the second edition, the preface to the second edition of Capital Volume 1, I forget where, he does have a sentence that he says, uh, I remain a, you know, a committed student of the great thinker Hegel, uh, whose method, and he means the science of logic, I'm using in Capital in order to explain the movement of Capital. Right, so so Hegel is a complicated figure that is probably I think the more I, I have started to read Hegel again very closely because I haven't done it before very closely, um, but the more I read Hegel, I realize that it, with Hegel it's much more complicated and, and in some ways Marx is uh, a, a, an intensification of Hegel's dialectical thought, especially in his method in Capital, like how do you study um, uh, these social relations. But that's, that's sort of an, uh, uh, a, a side point. So I think I can just end this intro maybe by saying that um, in the early essays, but also in the early, further early works like the German ideology, uh, which comes a few years later, uh, you know, Marx kind of makes this point, like, so if we're gonna make the human being the origin, 
right, of, of our uh, perception of the world and our entire basis for thinking, how can we say that? And of course, it's connected to, uh, he connects it to, um, you know, the activities that are necessary in the material conditions of, uh, of life. You know, the, the, the problem of production, which, which essentially is paraphrasing the, the 1844 essay in The Strange Labor. But the main point, I think, that comes out of this essay, these essays early on, leading to the manifesto, is that Marx does this incredible thing, uh, which I think is, is, uh, is essentially, he, he, he says this in the German ideology, I think he says, how can we fight capitalists politically? Like, on what basis should we struggle politically, on the level of ideas and everything else? And he says, we cannot struggle against the dominant political system and economic system by criticizing its effects. Right, so we cannot shape our politics by saying, you know, um, uh, the biggest problem with capitalism in America today, for example, is the low wages that many Americans are paid, which makes it impossible for them to adequately reproduce themselves socially, right, or to remain humans. You know, it's not easy to do that. It's very difficult. We should not do that. That's not our fault. Striving for higher wages, you know, which is an effect. Uh, of, 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 of the capitalist uh, objectification of, of the human capacity to create through the process of labor uh, is not a very smart political strategy to strike at the system. You have to attack the basic premises upon which the system functions. So this, this is Marx's, I think, one of his clearest early uh, sort of revolutionary political ideas. Like you have to attack, identify and attack the premises. And if the premises are shifting, uh, you have to keep track of that and, and adjust your politics accordingly, and you're thinking about it. Uh, and here, I think Marx is a revolution in thought, in addition to everything that he does in this essay, is essentially that he picks a very small <coughs> social <coughs> class of his time, the proletariat, which was an insignificant part of the, the total German, uh, um, you know, uh, non-wealth owning social classes, whether there were the remnants of the aristocrats or the emerging capital-owning social class. He takes this small, um, isolated, impoverished, illiterate, you know, social class, and he basically literally promotes it in the manifesto by ordaining it with revolutionary potential. Now, some people say that's very sort of insightful and Marx read history 100 years ahead, which is possible, but in addition to that, he did something uh, that he said he was going to do. He basically said, okay, well, what is the, the premise upon which capitalist societies function? You know, and, and of course it has to do with the specific arrangement of the, of the productive process, right? And in this productive process, the proletariat seem to play the most fundamentally important role, even if they don't do it now, right? So he essentially prematurely elevates this social class and gives and assigns to it the revolutionary potential even before it reached its time, right? And he does that knowing that it's, it's premature to do it, but he does it as a way of creating a new way of looking at or thinking about politics. He kind of introduces a new concept, even if that concept is not at that time the politically, uh, 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 the, the concept that has power in waiting, right? So I think that's an extremely in interesting kind of uh, gamble that Marx takes on the level of thought by elevating this m essentially marginal political class, social class, which has this potential because of his accurate reading of the premises of capitalism, but in actual everyday life, that social class is nowhere near in a position to actualize itself and challenge the, the hegemony of the capitalists, but that's not important. So, so it's not always important to, to identify what social class seems to be in a position of relative power, relative those who are in power, the more important thing is to um, to take the plunge. So there's there's an element of this is sort of Althusser, the 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 elitory of the encounter. There's an element of risk taking in revolutionary politics, which requires concept formation by doing the concept. Right. So I think this is another part of Marxist politics that uh, was practiced by people like Lenin or Gramsci or Lukacs, but which was not sort of practiced by other Marxists. You know? So I think this is an interesting element of, of Marx's um, sort of uh, revolution in thought. But we can also talk about the revolution in thinking in logic and sort of, um, um, so there's two ways, according to um, post-enlightenment kind of, but also for Aristotle, there's two ways to think logically. Uh, one way is to think logically by doing something. So, so Marx, when writing Capital, 
he was thinking through his dialectical logic that he was improvising and writing and, and, and coming up with using Hegel, but he was sort of in the spur of the moment as he was trying to understand capital's movements in a society, he was actually also doing a particular logic. There's a moment of creation and invention. Um, if, that if that method is successful, succeeding scholars or thinkers uh, would codify this logic into an organon in Aristotle's sense, and it becomes a toolbox for applying this toolbox to a particular object of study. So you can have a lot, dialectical logic can function as a way of doing something, or as a way of thinking about something through it, right? As an external object that, is, that exists as a tool, as a body of learning that you apply to the study of economics or politics or whatever. So this is what, for example, 20th century Marxism does very often. It uses dialectical logic uh, as a tool at applying it to revolutionary politics. And the problem emerges when the social conditions change and you apply a tool chest that was invented after the invention of capital based on Marx's analysis of capital, but then you apply this codified system of logical uh, thinking to a social reality that no longer functions like the capital functioning and described by Marx in the 19th century. Yeah, it, it's, it, it's kind of interesting that uh, the, um, like, I was reading, I don't know, I guess we're going to, we're going to read it later on, uh, Carl Korsch um, talks about how the, the early revolutionary Marx was really thinking through revolution, and he, ha he divides it up into kind of three, three epics. You know, the first epic being pre-1850, which he calls the revolutionary Marx, post-1850, which he calls the theoretical Marx, and then uh, after the 1890s, the, <laughs> the vulgar Marxists take over. <laughs> yeah. Michael I mean, said he's going to uh, send a PDF of the course, and I think you're going to do the first chapter for... Uh, yeah. Potentially yeah, he's pretty insightful, actually. Yeah, oh, yeah. So, I mean, this was sort of like what I was going to want to say is the general frame frame of, uh, of this particular essay. So, maybe if you want, you can go to, to the essay. It's very so strange. Well, I, I think there are at least four examples of it's, 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 it's estrangement or alienation in this section of the 1844 manuscripts, which I think when the they were in the archives and not released for a long time. And I'm not sure if Lukács had you know the had read them right then. What happened to the archives? So uh, during World War I, right after World War I, when uh, you know, there was this uh, revolution in Germany, or an attempt, there were several revolutionary attempts in Germany, like the you know, Bavarian Republic, and everything that Rosa Luxemburg was involved in. But the, um, the reactionary forces won the, the Civil War, which was very short. and. Um, so as as German politics sort of evolved through the 20s, uh, you know, after that event uh, towards fascism, uh, uh, German communists, uh, I, I don't know if it was done in one lump, I don't think it was done one one time at one time, but during several, there were several trips, so to speak, that moved, the Soviet Union essentially bought the archives, the, the collected archives of, uh, of, of, of Marx and Engels. And um, there was one particular revolutionary by the name of Yazanov, he was a, um, he was a revolutionary, but also trained in philosophy. Uh, and he had the initiative in the, the 1920s to create uh, the Marxist uh, Engels Institute. And they commissioned one of the sort of great modernist architects, Soviet architects, to design this really futuristic building. It was basically like a Bauhaus design, you know, this extraordinary four-story building in Moscow. And then they stored the papers in there. And, the, and basically the agreement was that the Soviets were going to, the Soviet government was going to do its best to buy and essentially uh, store any Marxist or Marxist-derived work published in the world, right? Because it was going to be like a library of the repository of, of left ideas. And it started with the collection of the bought papers of Marx and Engels and, you know, uh, archives and, and so on and so forth. And then Yozanov and his staff went to work, you know? They basically started reading everything, all the letters and to see if there's anything of value beyond what's already known. In fact, Lukács, when he left, uh, uh, I think Vienna, because he fl Hungary also had a revolutionary uprising in 1919, uh, where there was a brief takeover of state power, 
And Lukash was, I think, the minister of culture for like nine months or eight months. Um, and But then they lost too right. to the counter-revolution. And so Lukács was a political refugee in Vienna, I believe, for a little bit. But there was an, uh, basically the, the news broke that the secret police, Hungarian secret police, w uh, sent agents to kidnap him and bring him back to uh, to Budapest, and where he'd be, you know, tried for treason and killed, essentially, shot. Because again, like Gramsci, Lukács was seen as a very dangerous uh, revolutionary th because he was a thinker, and and not only that, but he was also so you know he carried a gun and he he, he was he was a revolutionary in the sense that he had committed himself to politics uh, on, on the highest level, but he was also writing articles that were published in journals that were read by many people who had sort of uh, influence in Hungarian society. Uh, people, you know, when he was Minister of, of Culture in Hungary in 1919, for example, they started organizing public schools, like new type of public schools, where teachers would teach a new type of an education, you know, kind of a, uh, what we would call today like a secularist kind of, uh, you know, uh, progressive education. Uh, so clearly they were starting to build hegemony very slowly or attempting to build hegemony. So Lukács was very dangerous like Gramsci, so they were going to kidnap him. So Lukács has this, these, this, these letters uh, describing uh, to friends what's happening. He's like, they're looking for me. I was followed today on, on this boulevard, but I lost them because this cafe has a back entry and I was able to lose them. <laughs> so, he, you know, and, and he was fearing for his life essentially, so he thought he was going to die in a shootout because he, he said he's not going to allow himself to be captured. You know? So this was the kind of thing that's happening. So eventually somebody said, well, we should just go to the Soviet Union because, you know, here they'll catch you, you know. So he ends up going to the Soviet Union and, and he ends up working in the Marx Engels, uh, you know, archives. But that's after he writes the essay, right. you know, he hadn't in, read, in this book. He hadn't yeah. had the benefit of reading this. Of course, the same ideas are other places. So he quotes a lot from, you know, uh, Chapter one of the first so we have a we have a rediscovery of the concept of alienation in Marx's philosophy twice, right? First, Marx writes about it, and then Lukacs independently writes about it. Uh, no, no, he no, he got it not from, he, right, from but Marx, I mean, but not from this particular. He got it from Marx, but he writing. didn't get it from this explicit yeah. uh, articulation. No, it's also the, explicit later on. It's not that it's not explicit, but it's more fragmented, you know, in the sense that it's 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 a little bit. But yeah, here here he's a bit more expansive. And also a little bit more confusing in a sense because he talks about estrangement and alienation. And, and I think there are four examples and at least two distinct meanings because the first is estrangement of labor in the sense that the product of labor is taken away from the worker. So there's a literal estrangement, right? It's taken from you, which is an important dimension, of course, of of capitalism and capitalist production and the labor process uh, under capitalism because um, number one, it makes possible uh, the technical division of labor that capitalism presupposes, that you break up the production process into the most basic of steps. And not only do you, in a sense, you know, uh, uh, as Harry Braverman Monopoly, his work on, on monopoly and uh, capitalism uh, explained is a kind of de-skilling of labor. You know, labor loses its capacity to produce. You know, they just become, which is, we've talked about many times, of course, is omnipresent, you know, continues in ever more insidious ways. But at the same time, it'll, it makes possible uh, uh, capitalist exploitation, you know, in the narrow sense. So. You have one notion of alienation as a dimension of exploitation, that the product of your labor is taken from you. You no longer have control over that. And that makes possible exploitation as we know it under uh, the, the, the capitalist system. So that's a literal understanding of, uh, of alienation. The, your labor is alienated from you, taken from you, and takes the form then of a commodity, an object, whatever the uh, so that so the, uh, the case may be. So that yeah, is that yeah. that is the most easy, perhaps, right? right. Understanding and of a strange. Maybe we want to add sort of what happens when that happens, right? So in other words, Marx is saying so because we become human, we are, we are human because of our direct relationship to this process of production, this pro sorry, this process of labor, yeah. uh, which is directly, of course, part of nature, 
Okay. But that, but I think then we get to a second meaning. Let's go step by step. Okay, and then we'll do the this first. The first. What happens? The first of a, a, a meaning of alienation or estrangement is the older one, a more literal one, which is something is taken. You are, something is estranged from you. It's taken from you. In this case, the product of your labor. Because of that, or and or because of the fact that. Social relations are increasingly mediated by commodities, by the commodity form. Then you have a second notion of alienation, which is what you're referring to, which is a certain kind of misrecognition or reification, as Lukács would uh, would, would uh, phrase it, of e e in capitalist societies. And that takes. There are three instances of that. First of all, because the labor process itself becomes so routinized and mechanized and controlled from above, and because you enter the production process as if you were a commodity, selling your labor power, let's say in the labor market, Mark says, you people become reified from themselves. Man becomes reified from their human, the species being, as, as he would say you know, from their nature, which means what? Because we sell our, our labor, because we sell our labor because, as labor power. Yes, because because uh, 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 we, in effect, function as if we're a commodity in the labor market and in the labor process itself. In so in other words, the, the process, the, the ability to labor, the ability to create something, which doesn't, for Marx, doesn't mean uh, the ability to go to work and, for example, teach a lesson or for money or make lattes and so on. Labor is sort of like the general description of uh, our functioning that differentiates us from animals, the way he says it, right? So labor right. just involves not only our uh, sort of ability to, it's not just craftsmanship, right? It's not just acquired knowledge. It's not knowledge that allows you to do something that's also clearly part of labor. But labor also involves sort of the um, uh, creativity, for example, it requires use of your senses, right, in, in every possible imaginable way. It, it has to do with desire as well, right? So laboring um, is, is, for Marx, this kind of all-encompassing foundational or fundamental property that humans have that all of a sudden, for crazy reason or strange or unanticipated reason, is you can no longer engage in that because if you did, you wouldn't be able to survive. Uh, you wouldn't be able to get food. And a certain part of that ability of you, whatever the, the, the capitalist that buys that from you, considers labor, which becomes labor power. So if, if this represents your total capacity for labor, right, your, your you know, the kind of the fusion of your thought, your desire, your, your muscular, your sort of physical abilities, your desires, the subconscious, unconscious, everything that allows you to sort of think and do. If this sort of imaginary box represent this, for some reason, you redef you're forced to redefine and live your life by essentially accessing this part of your labor capacity, if you will, and this becomes essentially, so the first problem is not only you're reduced in your ability to labor by only tapping into the part that's considered useful to the capitalist, but even that part you do not control anymore and is controlled by the managers, which you have to sort of exchange for the pieces of money that you, you would buy the commodity. But I would say it's more simple than that. Or it's more, you know, more basic than that, yeah. this question. Because uh, 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 the question presupposes, what is it to be human? Right? What as is opposed what? To be human as opposed to being animal. Right. And Marx, Marx's argument is that work is something that's common to other animals. So it's not particularly a human characteristic to be able to work. Right. What the is human? The beavers and the birds. Work. Yes, right. The bees so, and all these things. Yeah. What is human is to create. And under capitalism, that creative dimension to our, uh, uh, of our, uh, our let's say productive uh, uh, existence is taken away. Because you enter the production process as if you were a commodity, and you have this technical division of What labor. does it mean to enter the work process as a commodity? You are treated as if you were a commodity. 
and you treat you're, yourself you're not allowed to create as if you were a commodity. Excuse me. You're not allowed to create or be creative unsupervised. In other words, not well. The commodification of if human you're labor supervised, affects the creativity. If right? you're no, but if, no. no, if you're supervised or not, I think is not. I mean, it might be the case that the the vast majority are supervised. Some may be supervisors, but even if you're supervisor, it doesn't mean you are really have this creative life in, in the workplace, as it were. Uh, uh, what it means is it's made me it's made me mechanistic. It's repetitive. There's no creativity that one has in that uh, context. And then as he notes, this is on, on in, the, in this version of the, you know, the early, the <laughs> Penguin early writing, is page 327 here. It's about probably three or four pages into this, or five pages into this strange labor. He says here, the result is that man, the worker, feels he is acting freely only in his animal functions, eating, drinking, and procreating. Page 111. Or, at most, in his dwelling in adornment. While his human function, in his human function, he is nothing more than an animal. <coughs> it is true that eating, drinking, and procreating, etc., are also genu genuine hu human functions. However, when abstracted from the other aspects of human activity and turned into final exclusive ends, they are animal. So you have a great alienation, in this sense, of humans from their nature, their species being as creative as thinkers as creative beings. And people seek meaning and uh, uh, in their lives through what what those elements that we have common in common with animals, which is eating, procreating, and so forth. You know, here's an interesting uh, opening here for, 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 for what we're going to read in, in this class later on, but also what Michael said in some senses before, that, that there's this differentiation between thinking and sort of thought through objects of, of knowledge, right? And so in other words, uh, thinking has this thinking is this originary capacity, is this first principle in Marx. You know, through thinking, you tap into the creative aspect of us, the, the very thing that makes us human. And then once we think something, and if we choose to sort of warehouse it and organize it in a certain way, we form theoretical bodies of knowledge, right? So this becomes a, a sort of kind of a, a later on topic for discussion in the tradition, but also outside of the Marxist tradition, like Heidegger makes this very same distinction. He says thinking is essentially the ability to, to paraphrase the language that we're using, thinking is essentially the way to exist on the level of the origin. It's, it's on the level of, of kind of, or like Nietzsche would say, in the level of, of exercising the will to power. You're, you're in the midst of some kind of a struggle of ideas, of, of against other people or against, na you know, whatever the case might be. And in this process, you are tapping into the inherent stuff and capacity that allows you to, it does sound metaphysical, <laughs> right, in a certain sense, but, but that's very different from what Lukács would say in the essay, the, the hallmarks of capitalist productive processes which form relations of reification, which are the rationalized, rationalist, rational, codified bodies of knowledge, right? So for example, when uh, the when if we worked in a in a modern factory or in a modern office or whatever the case might be, uh, the the codified systems of rules, the internalized body of knowledge that makes that, for example, accounting firm function or the university function, uh, by definition presupposes that thinking is not permitted on the level of of the rules. The rules, of course, apply to those who are just you know, the, the workers in this case. The rules might be selectively not applicable to those who are required to think. And this is where the, the modern division of the creative thinker of the computer startup, which is devoid of rules relative to, for example, the um, uh, university where there are the public school system where the teachers have to obey these rules, right? So this becomes an interesting, I think, uh, extension from Marx's emphasis on the ability to be creative as the fundamental uh, feature of, of of what does it mean to be human? And that, of course, well, is... This, this, this is not... Marx has not come up with... This is not original to Marx. No, no. We can go right, back but to his earlier influences, and it's there as well. It's an old... Well, Aristotle It's an old distinction. Too. Aristotle yeah. says it's an old... We've talked about this many times, but the, the, the relationship between the human and the animal from the very beginning of, at least in Western philosophy or Western thought, was a question of who can think. But what you don't Thinking find... Thinking was considered to be the human characteristic. 
And there were some debates about whether other things could think as well, not only humans. And that was the debate. That was the debate. Marx is falling on, uh, 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 seems to follow pretty closely to yes. uh, Descartes and Plato, others, which is that humans think. But the new part think. that Marx They're has, simply driven by instinct. Which you don't have in Plato or uh, Descartes or, or Aristotle, is this Well, Aristotle is different. In is the way. shift of the focus to the worker as the political subject. You know. But that's something else. We're right. talking about this question right. of, of alienation of man from his or herself and what that means. And, th and in this case, right, it means that whereas to be human is to create. That's why, for example, Jacques Ranciere, in his uh, wonderful book, The Knights of Labor, he considers to be, which is about uh, French cobblers in the 19th century, 1830s, I think, or so. Uh, who at night would be poets. So it's people who during the day make their living by making the Jews, and, na and at night there's this whole subculture of, of, po of, of these Parisian poets who are by day making. So he sees that as a great revolutionary moment where they refuse to identify as workers. They refuse their production to simply being uh, uh, factors of production in that sense, workers, and they embrace their, their, their creative capacity, you know, they, it becomes a revolutionary uh, act for Ranciere to be a poet. <coughs> I mean, one of the ways <coughs> I think about alienation or estrangement is if you're excluded from organizing your own labor. So yes. I, I perform some labor, but if I have no, I, I'm not part of organizing my own labor, right. then I'm forced to labor in an alienated way. And that seems to parallel in some way like the <laughs> alienation of yourself or your consciousness. Like if you can't organize your own labor, something hap you know, something happens to you, which is I guess this verification of, of, of yourself in some sense. You don't have to think as much, maybe. Yeah, but it's just an interesting notion that, you know, the hmm. idea of organizing one's labor as opposed to being told what to do, you know, yeah. is it just that simple way of thinking about it. Um, it's a little bit like children. If you tell them what to do, it's different from them self-organizing. Mm -hmm. right. I think they want to self-organize, and adults keep telling them what to do, and so they can't self-organize. Um, yeah. Even if you can self-organize, I would think like the artist, for example, the musician or the visual artist has to some some leeway in that self-organization. But if there's no market for the product. Where is that artist, right? There, and, and that's dependent upon the ideologies of the time or the preferences of the time. Well, the market the, the, in this like case. The artist still has to live in, in the, Well, that's market. a separate matter. For one to do art doesn't mean there has to be a market for someone to, to buy it. How does that artist live then? That's another matter. But, it, but, but, but art, it, maybe art in capital society presupposes that. But that's obviously, it's, it's not, that's not some kind of. World. Universal okay. principle. Thanks. That well, art's a commodity too. Right. That's huh? Art just becomes a commodity, like right, like, yes. every, like every other right. commodity. Yes, it's the, it that's is why you know I, I'm very uh, uh, critical of all these PBS shows that oh. try to come off as high, you know, or even middle brow culture, where it's all about <laughs> reducing everything to the exchange value of <coughs> beautiful, the beautiful vase, and it's worth you know. <laughs> Eight hundred dollars. Yeah. You know, it's yeah. it's a great well, it's a great bourgeois. Prep, you know. Perfect. <laughs> and what's happened now is what used to be considered really high art, like say Beethoven, Handel, right? Whatever. Again, I'm getting into yeah. preference here, but yeah. the lower forms, quote unquote. I realize I'm using all the wrong words, but in previous eras, what would be have been considered not acceptable for that kind of programming is now elevated to. The but position I, of I think art with Beethoven or, or even we, high art. Yeah, we can use the analogy for you know, in more con like jazz or, or rock uh, music, like for example. Talking about yeah, basic pop stuff or is now considered like people have you know like concert Beethoven, hall music. <laughs> who was a Hegel's contemporary? You know when Beethoven was, you know who supported the French Revolution. Right? Beethoven was a radical kind of a Democrat in, in the in, in the right. language of the work. He didn't bow when the prince. Prince's, you know, horse carriage rolled by. Yeah. He turned his back, and and they stopped. And the prince was like, "How dare you!" Like, they sent somebody over. They're like, "How dare you not bow to the prince?" You know, and he said, the guy said, "Beethoven, Beethoven does not bow to any princes." 
like in the third percent now. But, in but that he took the money. But even there, he took the money, but he subjected them to this sonic assault, which was extraordinarily offensive and shocking. Because that music was, I mean, you could, if you <laughs> think about this notion of thinking as the, being creative and, yes. in other words, operating and constantly challenging the codified practices of how to do things that are sort of ossified, you know, a, a commodity which is ossified labor, Marx said, right, in a different place. When you buy a cup of coffee, this contains the dead labor, not dead in the, in sort of like the sad sense, but dead in the sense that the, the labor that has been extend, it's been extinguished, it's been used, it, it performed its creative function and it formed a cup of coffee. If a commodity is the depository of, 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 of dead labor, um, capital is uh, dead labor. Of capital is dead labor, commodified labor, yeah. Then, then uh, uh, a pop tune in Beethoven's time is commodified labor as well because it's dead labor because it, it forms some kind of a templated use of musical language, which cookie cutter kind of a sonata that somebody wrote for to be easily digested, right? <coughs> and if you write a piece of music that violates sonically or the way it sounds or the way it functions, uh, the 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 sort of the. the the alternative musical commodity that that is the result of ossified dead labor, then then you are essentially doing the, the revolutionary act in, in, in music as well, you know. So I think in music, people like the free jazz movement in the United States, you know, the, the some of your innovators, they purposefully they're asked like, why are you doing music? They're like, we, we're doing music that you can't dance to easily. Like that was the, like that was one of the first things they said. Like our music, you will not be able to dance to very easily because we're not doing dance music. You know, yeah. this is something totally different. And that an example is an example of what Marx would say, uh, overcoming the alienation of having to play the same gig over and over in order to sell your labor power to the club owner to make a living. That's what I'm saying. It's yeah. not just about being supervised. It's about the way that there is a, a, that loss of the creative dimension to, to work. Work becomes just work. There's no creative element to it, and thus, you, you don't have meaning in your life as a human. And as a default, people then seek meaning, you know, in their domestic situation, you know, in, in terms of home life, eating, shitting, reproducing. Because um, this is now This is gospel. the beginning of that. This the is now. The losing anti Oedipus, by the way, it talks about eating and yeah. shitting. And it's kind of a paraphrase. Of but <laughs> this now is gospel, of course. I mean, everyone will say the most important thing is family and, you know, home life and you know okay you have to work maybe but you should keep that to a certain level so you can still have a meaningful but of course the pigs and the cows they reproduce too we're not the only you know I mean we're not the only ones there's no great achievement yeah um so you're emphasizing the, the creativity that I think that was one. you said that so was there was there a difference for you, Peter, between creativity and thinking, or they're the same? No, I think they're the same. Okay. I think they're the same. To and think is to imagine, is to be creative, means you're not just driven by instincts. The human animal distinction, in that sense, is a question of instinct versus thinking. You know, it's simply you're following the, you know, the commands, let's say, of your DNA, or there's something new there. You know, Marx, and it, you know, in, in that older tradition is saying, well, what is human is to be creative, to think, to imagine, you know, to do all these things. And, you know, I think it's amazingly, you know, I've, when, when I finished my uh, PhD and I was, I didn't have a full time, I was teaching part time, I, I, I had to make some money, you know, to find a way to make some money. So I, I, I would go down to Baltimore and I would fix some houses and then, and then it, I saw the people, you know, you could make money back then. Now it's not, not as easy uh, doing these things. But people would, it was amazing how much uh, uh, creativity people would in, put into, people were doing it to make money, first and foremost. But they would become very creative with how they fixed up these, uh, oftentimes in ways that they would make less money in the long run. Because you're going to spend more money to make something nicer, but you're not necessarily going to realize the, you know, that in, when you sell the place. Simply because it was their creation. They had control over it. They could, even though it's a banal thing, how you make the bathrooms or the kitchen or, or this and that, people still were invested in that way. And it was, a, you know, for them a very meaningful way of, of uh, 
of laboring because you could have that creative dimension there, as opposed to all you know so many other kinds of work you know working activities where you're simply you know going by by the rules as it were following the the pattern and there's no real creative capacity there. Now, to what degree all these things are still true is an open question because people like Paulo Verno or uh, 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 Tony Negri have now argue that creativity is a fundamental part of <coughs> the capitalist labor process. We've, you know, the, we've got, we've, we have what um, the multitude in the language of Paulo Verno or, or uh, social or, uh, workers. Uh, well, the, you know, in Gramsci's term, the, the general intellect. You know, as a real cre creative capacity, creative force, and that's more explicit for Marx. And it certainly it makes a lot of sense in terms of the kind of labor one performed uh, in the context of industrial capitalism. It is a very mind-numbing kind of uh, activity, and because of that, and because you are divorced from that creative dimension to uh, of your existence, you become alienated from your nature, from the species being. You know, as, one as of the says. counter answers to Marxism uh, in the '70s came from the, uh, <clears throat> like the, the Chicago School of Economics. So for example, Becker, you know, who's the major figure of the Chicago School of Neoclassical Economics, who's a very, you know, very serious thinker and and a very smart thinker for sort of their own his own political classes. Uh, continued hegemony, and he, he, he answered this charge, essentially, of that Marxists always levy against capitalist societies, that it forms this kind of unnatural, if you will, existence that stunts people by, by crippling us into these objectified social relations where we experience life and relations to each other as objects, you know, and, and this. So Becker basically, and this is what Foucault was reading, you know, in that lecture series of uh, 70, the lectures on biopolitics. 77. So Foucault kind of makes, tries to confront the danger of the neoclassical economic, smart e neoclassical economists, anti-Marxist uh, argument. Becker said, every worker actually, every human being owns capital. There is no such thing as capital is essentially accumulated by one social class by exploiting, you know, through al the alienated process, the, ma the mass of workers, and then the capitalists are the sort of owners of the wealth, social wealth and everything else, the capital. Uh, uh, ownership of capital, you know, capital is essentially, what is capital? Capital is essentially a form of wealth that is used with a specific purpose for increasing the, that wealth, right? This is one way of describing capital. If you have, you know, a million dollars in cash on your table, that's not capital. That's just a form of stored wealth. If you take the million, million dollars and you put it in motion using the, the formula that Marx dis uses to describe, you know, the general movement of capital and, you know, capital is exchanged uh, to, to purchase all the commodities C necessary for the formation of a new commodity that you own through your private property, the business, for example, that sells coffee. And then you, when you make the sale of the finished commodity, uh, you have the luxury of setting the price, right? And the price is calculated to be higher than the capital invested. And this is on the most basic level is the circulation of capital. Uh, Becker said that's not true. Actually, every human being has capital in their own ability to labor. So he uses Marx's very own statement here. Not the creativity, but also the creativity part. He says we're creative creatures. Every human being has the ability to be creatively engaging in the American economy. And if you haven't, that's essentially your problem. You know, that's a problem of, you know, you, you were unlucky and you had terrible parents or you're, you're turned out to be lazy, you chose the lazy way out, you didn't activate your entrepreneurial, i.e. you didn't activate the capital that's inherent in you, which means you didn't activate your thinking. So anybody in America can, be, can really be a capitalist. And uh, there is no something inherently true that uh, this society's economic structure actually well, Marx takes that creativity. Marx had already addressed you know. that, that argument. Of course. Because yeah, he says for something to be capital, has to be, or a commodity for that matter, has to be external to the owner. So there's a fundamental difference between, you know, I have X bushels of wheat and I exchange them to you for so much money versus I have my labor power to sell you and I exchange that for so much. Because the difference is I have to physically be present, you know, and that makes possible, obviously, 
the kind of instantiation that happens. Which is what makes the neoliberal theory society. like that so interesting as, as like a reification of right. what Marx is describing here. Because yeah. of course, yeah. from the perspective of the capitalists, that is true. Right? Yes. Like, we contain right. the potential for them to mobilize us as capital. So to then say, well, what you are is capital, yeah. is right. true from that perspective, certainly not from the perspective of the, of the existence of a human to court, but for our the way that we appear to a capitalist is as as capital either in motion or that could be put in motion right. for the capital. There is an added complication which we should address later maybe in the semester that is it possible that yeah you know uh, there are workers who are not who are workers of a company and are hired by the owners of the company but that their labor is actually not productive it doesn't result in surplus value and thus the Becker argument becomes even more subtle meaning was he only talking about those workers whose labor actually does produce surplus value for the capitalist and what and and not and he was not talking about the workers whose labor was not producing surplus value had no role in the in the wealth accumulation of the capitalist owner of the company but they still have to hire them for for purposes of political stability right so these become the interesting calculations that Marx wasn't talking about because he he was focusing on the big picture you know and maybe in his day capitalism didn't really work that way but maybe today it does so this becomes well, an interesting there's a lot uh, of volume too you know, about extended reproduction right so the right, question of labor is not only I mean it's not only in that moment of extraction of surplus labor let's say but the, the extended reproduction of capital presupposes also other so you we know, have domestic, to read volumes labor, two and three example, of capital a lot more than volume not one. Not productive <laughs> in the Marxist sense, yeah. in that, you know, housewives, let's say, are directly being exploited, you know, and there's a profit, but they're, they're necessary to the extended reproduction of uh, capitalist societies because without the wives at home cooking and doing all these, you know, the, the men would not be able to get, get back up in the morning and, and go to work. Your comment about, I'm sorry, I don't know your name, but your comment about organize, organizing your own labor, yeah. it just struck me that, um, and then you may briefly refer, I think, to what children do, but what struck me was that we don't let children organize their own labor anymore, which, I mean, yeah. play is the labor of childhood. That's correct. We don't let children organize their own play anymore. And in a sense, we are preparing them for alienated labor in their adult lives. It's all managed for them. That's they the function don't of the school system. Yeah. yeah, that's function of the school system, but after school, kids would come home and have the run of the neighborhood. Right. We hadn't decided that there was menace hiding in the bushes. We hadn't decided that slides were a setup for head trauma and concussion. <laughs> they hadn't decided that every aspect of childhood had to be surveilled. And children really could organize their own labor. Not anymore. It's all Suzuki violin lessons and, you know, um, karate. And, you know. My friend has a child who just entered kindergarten what? and she received a schedule a delineated schedule for that five-year-old child. Like she goes to work. Yeah. And it's something like 2.17 to 2.34 <laughs> is iPad time for the five-year-olds. <laughs> and then 2.35 to 2.46 is nap. It's, it's these sort of strange yeah. arrangements, not on the quarter hour, but it's completely planned. But how but are you ever planned. gonna it's know what you love? Years. I mean, play is worked way. in. Right? How Michael, do you no, ever well, Michael find Apple your passion? Has, uh, um, Michael. Who's Michael Apple? He's a Marxist right to education, but he has uh, Who's that? what a name, Sorry. Michael Apple. Apple. Michael Apple. Michael Apple. <laughs> on, uh, he's got a, he, one of the, I'm trying to think of the name of the book. I think it's something in curriculum. But he has a chapter on the school day. The school day. Which is, of course, from Model on Chapter 10 from uh, Volume 1 of Capital. But there he shows how you have two things going on in the way the school day is organized. It's about the hidden curriculum in that sense. Oh, right. I mean, that's what yeah. the, the term people use. But it's, it's about how you have this notion of work time and play time built in. So it's the time that you are, it marks, I mean, this, here you see the parallel. Your time to be free, which is your domestic, like your home time or domestic time, versus when you're on the clock, you know, the boss's time but or the teacher's time, where you have to be quiet and listen and do your work. 
which is a difficult concept, obviously for. But you know, after so many years of indoctrination in the schools, people become second nature. Well, schools yeah. are factories in that sense. I mean, yeah. you know, the yeah. origin of the modern Even the universal free school time, is, however, is a factory. Is constrained, yeah. right, by this. Yeah. Well, it's schedule. but less it's constrained. You can be free during this time. Yes, but it, but but the, the, but that's part of the distinction between work time and play time. The indoctrination. Yeah, and then the other element, which is a, a even more a more clever observation in some ways, is that the way the room, let's say, is set up and decorated, the toys usually are very low. Low? In the sight of the yeah. children. So they have to learn how to control themselves because, of course, the 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 attraction is always there. To, you know, they're here. They go play with the toys, and you can see them all around the room. But they have to, you know, that goes to become self-discipline. <laughs> <laughs> self gratification. <laughs> <laughs> Ideology and curriculum is the name of the, the title of the book. But uh, um, yeah, these are, of course, these are, you know, and you have it all in that sense this alienation. But it also shows how uh, deeply uh, successful capitalism has been. In in in, in uh, uh, substituting liberal values of security and safety above all else. So, I mean, if if I were to say to Arto, look, the only way I can really be creative and write is if I'm smoking. So I have to start smoking again because it, he's going to say to me, "Yo, you're crazy. You know, it's not. It's bad." You should vape. It's healthy. He's not. <laughs> <laughs> you see, he's not going to say yes, right? Do heroin and smoke, or do anything you have to do to write a great poem, because the number one, L, you know, I mean, not that I'm saying if you do a lot of heroin, you're going to become a great poet, obviously, but the number one value is going to be uh, security and safety. So the same thing, of course, with the kids, too. I mean, if the number one value and everything else is tertiary at best. Um, but that goes back to this, of course, this idea of what is it to be human? And Marx saying, well, to be human is to be creative. That's our, we're not only, you know, we have more than just that as human beings. We also do the other things which you know, the other animals do. But what is particular to us as a species is creation, and that is the highest value. That is what, you know, makes us human. You know? and of course, and that if you can objectify away. the creative relation, the creative aspect, or alienate that as well, then you really. Well, that's what that's what he. Yeah, that's what Marx is talking really about. Uh, and thus, an all we're left with is the animal dimension. That's why we've talked about this many times. That you know, it's not an accident that suddenly the dogs get you. <laughs> yeah, the things. dog naming. Yeah. So <laughs> that's one. That's one. Dimension. Then from that follows, so we have alienation or, 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 or estrangement as the product of labor is taken from them. Then we have reification or alienation in that humans misrecognize themselves, right? We are alienated from our act, true nature, and in that sense, we simply and become nature reduced. itself. We're getting to that. We simply become reduced to animals. Right? We seek meaning in the eating and the, sh and the shitting and the reproducing. Concurring to that, he says, because our relationships with other people are mediated through commodities, we become alienated from society. So you have the alienation of man from themselves. You have the alienation of man from society, number two. Why? Because what had been human relations, the human relation that you are engaged in, when you go to the market and you buy apples, for example, you no longer experience as a relationship between you and other people, and you see it as a relationship between you and a thing. Those that bag of apples, that's over. because certainly there are there's a farm somewhere, and farmers or you know people who work who trim the apple trees. And you only see the bag of apples. You only see the bag of apples. So that's another source of alienation. Meaning you think the bag of apples, as that's all there is to it. Even if that you think about the farm, it's still yeah, that it, that's, that's a question. Does, what does alienation in this sense mean? Uh, uh, does it mean, you know, obviously you know 
that there are the farm, you know, the apples don't fall from the sky. You know that. That somewhere there's a farm and there are people who work on the farm and there are people who produce the stuff. But you don't experience that relationship as a relationship between you and other people. You only experience that as a relationship between you and a thing, in this case, the apples themselves. Lukács quotes Kant at one point and says that in a marriage, the, I mean, I'm sort of paraphrasing, the two people are sort of renting each other yes. effectively. <laughs> <laughs> and that it's just an exchange of commodity <laughs> for commodity, <laughs> and that your you know yourself, your body is really just an object serving another object, and that you know I mean Kant had, I suppose had his own is looking for something beyond that. But well you know what what is a I don't know just raise the question what what would be a a Marxist marriage? It, you know in a sense it, it, yeah because the the commodified marriage is just an object relation. There's, no, well not her, but there was a, there was a Soviet re feminist, uh, Kolontai, who wrote a book on sexuality and Marxism, like the no new Soviet person. And I, I'm forgetting the exact argument, but their, their thinking was something like, um, you don't emphasize sexuality. Sexuality is not important because it's a bourgeois construct she said, right? So essentially, what Foucault's analysis in the history of sexuality, that, that what we understand by sexuality and sort of the family norms are sort of the constructs of the Victorian you know, world and whatnot. So in the early 1920s, Colin Tai wrote this book. I think it was the early 1920s, but she was, they were trying to implement this. They basically said sexuality is, is not an important, it's not important to politicize sexuality. You could basically do whatever you want on the question of whoever you want to date. The family then becomes simply a matter of um, personal choice, however you think about it. But we will not have a state-defined or sanctioned thing that we will encourage the formation of a family, especially the family that we inherited from the Russian Empire as this notion of a business transaction related to the keeping the property uh, within the social class or whatever. So, so Well, the transactional I interpretation is very... But also the legal liberal. There's obviously. no need to have the legal sanctification in order for. Well, they never had. Marriage. Well, you know, you don't need to have legal sanctification for patriarchy. They had it for a long time. Right, without but that for legal marriage, to, for the family to function in terms of its property reproductive purposes, you have to have. Well, we legal, know, we know, you know, we know. So you can claim no the inheritance in terms that of that the family uh, comes into existence and functions fundamentally as a mechanism of social of production and reproduction. That we know. I mean, of course, our friend Engels wrote, you know, one of the great works on this, on the origins of the family, private property, uh, and the state. So there's no question about the economic, let's say, nature of uh, of of, uh, of patriarchy in the patri patriarchal family. Uh, then the romantic liberal uh, notion of of of, of Romant of of love and marriage, you know, of marriage as this expression. That's something that comes, of course, later. Has a, it's not unrelated to this, in, in some ways. Um, uh, but I think Kant had his problems with when it came to women and sex. He was not. I wouldn't necessarily <laughs> treat him as the authority when it comes to saying this. I think what he died of, he, he never had the sex in his life. He died of virgin. I think, he, I think he had, he, re he dated one, one it was one, one, one experience. experience. As far as yes. we know, of course. <laughs> <laughs> How do we know that? <laughs> so I wouldn't necessarily, you know, I mean, he may not be the best source. Hegel found love in late in life. You know, he married uh, he somebody in his, I think, 50s and he had a kid and uh, or late fo early 50s like he was really in love with this person and then of course his sister immediately <laughs> killed herself after she got married and, and she said she said in the suicide note I blame you Friedrich for for, for, for my own death because you so you you know you this is treason you, I loved you and then now you love somebody else and that's it so they <laughs> these people had sometimes difficult you know <laughs> uh, but, it's, I, you but know, maybe I, we don't I know how it's real well, history I, I don't think it's because <laughs> they were thinkers. I think the Protestant tradition has a lot to yeah. answer for when it comes to some of these, some of these problems. The but that's not our, that's yeah, not our problem here. That's not our <laughs> problem. <laughs> <laughs> Marx was immune to those, you know, to these bourgeois, you know, uh, uh, precepts and guilt and so forth. Protestant guilt. He wasn't. He was. He was more immune to that. Uh, but we have then right alienation and the second notion of after man from himself. 
is alienation of man from society. Why? Because of the negation of the commodity form, of commodity fetishism. So you misunderstand or misrecognize your human relations as if they were relations between simply you and an object. And that's not because, and in the first chapter of Capital, where when Marx talks about commodity fetishism, he has a very interesting line where he says, I don't remember the exact wording, but he says the, the, the minds are private, but the body is, there's a, you know, there's a, a break between what is going on in the head and what the body is doing. Because uh, on one level, of course, right? Because it's not just you have the idea, you misrecognize your relationship to other people. You also misrecognize the uh, abstract character of the commodity itself in the act of exchange. And the, the great book on this that, it take, that takes up that theme is Alfred Son Renfro, Intellectual Manual Labor, where he really is, in, in, in that sense, is a, a Marxist critique of Kant. And sh by, by showing all these categories that Kant, you know, presumes come out of, you know, this just this deduction or, or logic, are in fact first contained in actions. They have that's material. precisely Marx's They have point material foundation, of course, of course. origin for, the, for, the, for human creativity and everything is this inhuman, r rational right. ability to make sense through rationality. And right. Marx is saying, actually, no, it all has to do with the actual social relations in their particular ways in which they're formed, yes. which conditions our consciousness. You know, the uh, psychologist Vygotsky had this great, f they asked him, so where do you think consciousness comes from? And he said, consciousness comes from, emerges in the conversation between you and the person you're talking to. You know, like sort of, the social relations themselves condition our mechanism for forming. Instead, instead of the rational approach that traditional psychologists used in his day and today, consciousness is, an a is a biological aspect of our brain chemistry. First of all, you know, and then out of that come our relationships and our abilities to think. Right. And, you know, they still look for consciousness with an MRI machine. Mm. You know, some of our colleagues in the psychology departments, <laughs> they have studies. They put people. They're like a list of names. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> like we put we we have a special app that, that looks at the signals and and of course they can detect useful things that can be used to treat, you know, brain disease or or they can measure energy levels, you know, produced by the electrical, uh, you know, the firing of the synapses, and this is all useful stuff, but, but that's, the, it's like the wrong tool to study something, like consciousness, but they're still looking for it. Mm -hmm. you know? um, I'm, I'm still not really getting this third type of alienation, right? So if I'm right. buying a bushel of apples, yes. um, what am I misrecognizing? Am I, what am I supposed to be recognizing? Am I supposed to be thinking about the labor of the apple picker? No, you know that there, you, that's what I'm saying, you know that there somewhere there is an apple picker. You know that. Right. It's not that you don't know that. But you never experienced that. Mm -hmm. And and, and the, the the what your action when you go to the supermarket, let's say, you exchange that five dollars, let's say, for the bag of apples. You're saying even something more than just the fact that you're not experiencing that social relation as a social relation, but as a relationship between you and an object. At that moment you're also asserting the equivalence between these two things. When you exchange the one for the other, you're saying these two things, the $5 is equal to the bag of apples. So I'm example. just recognizing it's exchange value. It's exchange value. Right. So thus, in, in, that, in terms of action, you are reducing uh, the apples simply to their abstract, even though your mind is not thinking that. What you're thinking is, do these apples look fresh? Do I like right. these you're kinds of apples? Value. You're right. It, right. right, it's completely, so that's what I'm saying, and Mark says in, in, in that, the first chapter of volume one, that distinction between the mind and the body, right? Mm -hmm. What the body is doing is distinct from what the mind is doing because so in your mind you're thinking about utility. The action is all about exchange. The action so of exchange is I mean, about equating, just a second, yeah. these two things uh, as if they were the same. And that abstraction, what, what that Alfred Song Ruffle terms that a concrete abstraction. It's an abstraction not of thought, but in action, which then makes certain abstractions possible. It just seems like abstraction rather than alienation. I'm, I'm not getting rid of the alienation. But the alienation is that, that because you go to the supermarket, you know, if I go back to Greece for the summer to the island and I want fish, I'll see my friend George, who's a fisherman, I say, George, give me some. When you go out 
tonight, you get some fish, you know, save some for me in the morning. There is, right, you, exp you, it's, it, you have the exchange, but you experience it as a human, okay. as a human relationship. When I, if I go to Fairway and I buy the fish, I know that the fish, there's a fisherman somewhere that they catch the fish, but I don't experience the relationship in that okay. way. It becomes reduced to simply a relationship between myself and an object, as it were. To add, like, just in yeah. Lukács' words, repeated abstractions produce alienation if they're generalized across everything that we do, right? So, for example, if you only, uh, so of course, okay, so another way of saying it is that, um, in pre-capital social relations, Marx said exchange value and use value were essentially fused. Right? There was no exchange value didn't have importance on its own, except if you went to buy something outside of your political your community. Right? And there and there were different rules for right. exchange. Then you relied on money, let's say, or something that represented. Right. Then the price measured through some kind of a third mediator became important. And then as soon as you went back to your town, everything was essentially exchange of use values most of the mm -hmm. time. Uh, it's when exchange value be stands on its own as an important category of human sort of um, uh, productive activity. Uh, even that's not significant in terms of alienation. For example, if you only had to rely on the abstraction called exchange value when you buy apples at Whole Foods for money, that's not a problem. You don't live in an alienated world. Right. It's only if that becomes generalized, and this is where the Hegelian way of thinking is very helpful, there's a difference between singular or particular alienated experiences versus generalized alienated experiences. It's kind of like, like Du Bois, you know, writes in his description of racism where he says there's the formation of double consciousness in black people in America that's permanent, it's generalized. Like, only in the, in the privacy of your home can you not sort of act the way you're expected to act, but even there you will, he says, after a while, because you have false consciousness, you internalize. But the moment you leave the house, you have to, you're permanently subjected to that type of behavior, right? This very Marxist argument, it's essentially he's applying this to race, to racism. So, the, so Marx is saying, and Lukács is repeating, that the abstraction that we call exchange value as a way of conducting a human-to-human -human, uh, exchange that's based on usefulness. You want apples, and you, know, you want the, the store to get, to receive some kind of an equivalent so they can keep buying the apples and selling them to you. That's not a problem if, you're, if your abstraction is reduced to just buying apples at the supermarket. But if it's generalized across everything that you do, the family, love, you know, schooling, learning, which is what capitalism does, it generalizes the economic exchange relation, it elevates it to, to the only or the most important um, social relation, and then it forces everybody to look at life through that, that's when alienation takes place as a problem. Individual alienating experiences, um, Lukács would probably say, are not a problem, it's only when they become generalized. You know, So, so a series of abstractions that you, you have to constantly accept and engage in and submit to become sort of like the the problem right that's like think that's the about way i understand Sonic versus yeah exactly uh, exactly, exactly. Okay. so but it's a question of scale when capitalists did not have hegemony 19th century i don't know uh, russia you know that was not a society that that uh, where alienation or reification right. function there's other types of reification maybe through religion or but it wasn't capitalist reification but once you know if we go to russia today you know where the the, the economic exchange relation in that way is now the lens through which every single relation or many single relations, ma many social relations are uh, framed through, then you live in an alienated, right. then you become an alienated being. So I think that's the, God, that's the difference. So in a reification in a way, all, all, the, all subjects are alienated. Right. I mean, right. It just, you just, it's like automatic and it could be from birth. <laughs> right. Yeah, it's exactly. just that when you force to the specific economically grounded based relation between these particular social classes that, that produce this kind of a, a type of a reification is, which is only pe peculiar to capitalism, is then you have the type of alienation that they're, they're sort of talking about this kind of dehumanizing, you know. Right, well, we're um, yeah, we're talking you know. about the young, I mean, later, we'll have critiques later on. So someone like Althusser will say uh, alienation is a constant. All societies have alienation. So the idea that some Marxists had, including our friend uh, Lukács, that you can have a, a society with alienation is completely 
but uh, incorrect. I must interject exactly. again. There's Lukacs is doing this, and Marx is doing this with the proletariat by saying that if the proletariat assumes state power temporarily, it, it, it's going to destroy the state. And you know, he came close to the anarchist. Lenin, you know, too came very close to the anarchist position in certain moments. Uh, they're doing that for purposes of political strategy. When Lukacs is, is is saying this, I think. He's basically saying this for purposes of political well, strategy in the matter. context. Of, he's not saying this as a, as a truth the state that, you know, yeah. is something else, but the idea that if you get rid of capitalism, you can no longer have alienation, that was critiquing. Lukács doesn't believe that, though. But well, That's what I'm saying. Okay, yeah. maybe. I don't know. We have to... <laughs> but, uh, but the, 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 critique, <laughs> the critique of that, yeah. so it doesn't matter if you believe it. I think I, it doesn't matter what if, I'm if, if, you, if you... Act if you act on it. It's this, what difference does it make? How I think we have to differentiate believe? in Marxist. We're not thought. Protestants. We have to differentiate in Marxist <laughs> thought the difference between Marxist rewriting of a new philosophy and Marxist ideas that are implemented, like Gramsci would say, in in in, in the political struggle itself. The two idea, the two modes of thinking are of course related, but they have different modes of expression. You know, and I think that's an important thing that got lost, for example, in dogmatic Marxism, like in the Soviet mainstream Marxism or in Western Marxism which never got to the revolutionary part you know it was all about the philosophical class struggle but that's not enough right so when Marx there's a dualism uh, because he's a dialectical thinker and the negate so so um, that's another conversation but I think no, there's two the always two ways to read Marx uh, both in the philosophical arguments which have an, a notion of sort of but yeah but truths in, in Marx in a different way from Hegel, forgive the strategic you know uh, uh, um, Movements of saying the specter haunts. Lenin Western called the peasants Europe, proletariat. Are, That's completely wrong, right? But it has to Europe be done in order time. to. Yeah, but there's something yeah. else. Marx presupposes, as with Feuerbach, for example, presupposes that that alienation in society uh, exists because there is some activity that produces it. There's some kind of alienating dimension to that culture, that society that results in this, and we have to get rid of it, right? He thinks, for example, the need for religion can be done away with if we, if we solve the problems that, or, or the kinds of, 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 of uh, um, uh, needs that exist in society. You, you no longer have that kind of alienation. You won't have a need for and religion. And Althusser says that's not, you can have a different kind of alienation. Althusser says that always you have misrecognition ideology in society that uh, you know it's n it's a whenever whenever you have language that's going to be present but do you There's see going to be a Sarah's gap position is very immature politically how do you do political struggle by doing that by saying that that no matter what happens we're going to risk our lives to overcome ca the capitalist state in France only to be to encounter a different set of alienation again then why the hell would I want to risk my life because it's not it's not about alienation simply the what is revolutionary it struggle it can be other things. It can be power. Well, isn't it? I mean, one of the implications of this, right, is that it's not enough for workers to take over the state <coughs> because commodification will still exist. So, it, uh, so well, no, commodification that need not still exist. But I mean, the um, right. So um, it's not simply enough for workers to run a state that still oversees private property and wage labor. That private property itself and the relation between property and labor has to Which also be transformed right. in everyday life. Page one, because the senior quoting. Yeah. yeah, yeah, exactly, exactly. So the um, right. So yeah. So the, the point is uh, is that you have to have, which is one of the reasons Lukács was minister of culture for that period of time, right? Is that it's not simply about uh, workers' movement taking over the state. It's about reforming the culture of everyday life, right. so that um, you're not living out commodification. Right. In, in everyday life. But even in that example, because if you ask, let's say, the question to someone like a, a Lacan, you know, can you not have, he said, no, all you have, right, because who is the real you? You know, right, revolutionary, academic, father, citizen, whatever, the real you is beyond all these particular identifications. So every identification you have, as a sense, has a, a, a dimension of alienation or misrecognition because you are uh, pr taking the partial and presenting it as the whole, whereas the real you would be beyond all these particularities. You know, that would be the kind of lack, let's say, the gap between the real and, and the level of, 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 of the symbolic order. It's the same in Althusser. You always have idea, you always have lived experience. You're always gonna have a gap between, let's say, the real and how you experience the world and perceive the world. 
So his argument was, in, in, in opposition to uh, some of these people who rely on, on, on uh, ideas of alienation, that alienation can't be, a uh, to get rid of alienation can't be the global revolution because it's impossible. It's an impossibility. In all societies you're going to have, it's going to be an issue. It's going to be, a, you're, not, you're not going to solve it by saying, you know, after we get rid of capitalism, there will be no more alienation. You know, it's a, you know, it's a constant, you know, the, the, he says the people who, who think they can be outside of ideology are the ones who are most trapped within it, in a sense. You know, but you again, have, you have to recognize that all of dimension. these people like Marx and Lukács, the purpose of revolutionary politics was to, it was much simpler than that. The, the initial goal was to interrupt the functioning of alienation, let's say, on the level of the ways described here. It was not the total elimination of the transcendence of, of of the problematic itself, but they were focusing on the alienation as the product of and function of capitalist economic exchange and production. So this is the initial step that sh that's the focus of your, what's gonna happen beyond that, who knows, right? But in other words, the Revolutionary Act always prioritizes the initial um, step, which is directly related to uh, the question of the dominant social relations, you know, the state, the whatever. What happens after that is open. That's why it's freedom. Right? That's you're gonna, that, is, that rule world will but how, but Let me ask you this question. How you ask, let me ask you this question. Can you get rid of, because we have here the alienation of, of, uh, of man from themselves, you know, misrecognizing, the alienation of man from society, you misrecognize your social relations as relates to you and a thing, and then you have, of course, the alienation of man from nature and that the human the interactions with nature because nature takes the form of a commodity you experience nature as a, as a relationship between you and a thing you, know, you go to, to the hardware store you buy some two by fours or some plywood you don't experience it you know that it comes from nature there are trees somewhere they cut them down and so forth but your experience is not that your experience is one of you and these objects these commodities and thus you misunderstand or misrecognize, let's say, how we, in fact, are a uh, 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 part of or relate to, to nature, which is, of course, a very, uh, you know, central problem. There's an interesting question. Uh, what happens if you reduce alienation as a generalized social condition to a particular social condition only found in certain exchanges? No, but here's the difference. Which the is difference is between no. Right? The difference so is between far. saying you can eliminate alienation, or you can moderate the impact of alienation through a critical Sorry. understanding of the process. That's the difference. Because if you, because if you say you cannot, we cannot do away with alienation. You can say, well, we can we can you know m m uh, uh, lessen it in some ways. That might be possible. But to say we can eliminate is impossible, then the Althusserian ethic is, well, you, be, being conscious of that, being aware of the process, having an objective understanding to this, pro this process of subjectification, let's say, is the answer. It's, it, that's why, for example, to go back to, to Marx, you know, in the uh, a thesis on Feuerbach, you know, the famous one, thesis 11, right? With, philosophy of his own interpretive with the points that change it. He wrote that, and then he kept doing theory. He kept writing. Because he's he was creating a new philosophy. Yes, because, because the, the way of understanding itself is a way of in, in, intervention. There is that, and you were alluding to that when, in, in, in your earlier discussion, Mar, Marx and the Marxists understand that there is a short circuit between the empirical and the theoretical frame, as it were, that the way you categorize and explain and understand it is it, itself political and, and, and itself becomes part of the social existence of the thing. He, for example, has a, a wonderful analysis of how economic categories are a fundamental dimension of the existence of these economic relations themselves. You can't divorce one from the other. You know, well, they're not superfluous. They're not, they're not uh, ad, you know, they're, they are necessary to the existence of The example capitalism. is here too, right? Like on page 117, when he says, middle of page 117, where he says, uh, point number one, um, un un you know, he says, we understand now certain things that were unresolved before, they were mystified. Political economy, you know, of, written by Adam Smith, you know, and the labor theory of value, uh, starts from labor as the real source, soul of production. So this is Adam Smith, labor theory of value, right? That 
which was written before Marx's writing, this very influential sort of explanation of essentially capitalist, the basics of capitalist, this new thing called the capitalist organization of production. Yet to labor, it gives nothing, and to private property, everything. Confronting this contradiction, Proudhon, you know, Proudhon the French socialist and kind of nemesis of Marx, has decided in favor of labor against private property. Okay, right? So Proudhon corrects uh, Adam Smith's kind of, or his students' uh, uh, deviation. Um, we understand, however, that this apparent contradiction is the contradiction of a strange labor within itself, and that political economy has merely formulated the laws of alienated labor. We also understand, therefore, that wages and private property are identical, which is kind of an interesting corrective to common like trade, trade union understanding of, of, of sort of the virtues of the higher wage. Since the product is the object of labor, pays for labor itself, right? Uh, the product is the object of labor, pays for labor itself. In making the product, the commodity that, that my employer is gonna sell, that contains also the kernel of my own salary. Right? So most people, it was calculated in the 80s or early 90s, was it a sociological study, most people in an office job in the United States create enough value by working in the office equivalent to their daily wage by noon or by 11.30 or something like that. So, but you've committed to an eight hour work day in order to get paid, right? So you have to go back to work at 1 p.m. and work until five or six, that's surplus value. You still create value, if you don't, they'll fire you because you're unproductive. So you essentially work for free, that's one of the basis sources of of, of, of the increase of capital, right? So he's saying by creating the, the product, you already um, paid for your own labor to reproduce yourself. Therefore, the wage is but a necessary consequence of alienated labor. You don't need a wage if you didn't function in this type of organization of labor. There are other ways to organize labor that I'm sure humans will invent, you know, different from this, but this is not all that exists. After all, in the wage of labor, labor does not appear as an end in itself, but as the servant of the wage, right? And then there's an interesting thing about wages in the last paragraph. An enforced increase in wages um, would therefore be nothing but better payment for the slave, you know, famous sentence, and would not win either for the worker or for the labor their human status and dignity. Fair wage for fair days of work, is that the slogan that we use in our union? We don't use that. We don't even use that. Right, so so that's meaningless essentially. And if you want to target and 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 and, and complicate this issue of, of loss of meaning as as a fact, as a side effect of so you're suggesting we, we we negotiate for lower salaries? <laughs> <laughs> no, we do we do the Leninist or Gramscian approach, which is you use the fight for wage increases as only a means to an end, and not the end in itself. Well, we don't have a revo you know. No, I know. I mean, <laughs> <laughs> I'm just placing myself in 1921. Yes. No, <laughs> I'm, I'm, not, I'm not disagreeing with you. I'm saying that. Yeah. It's like when you criticize elections today, people say, well, you're against elections. You support, like, what less? And it's like, no, elections should just be a tool of, of politics, not the end of politics, you know. Yeah. yeah. Elections are anti-democratic. Of be course they're anti-democratic. They're, they're <laughs> profoundly anti-democratic. <laughs> But I mean, representative yeah. elections in the Republican sense. Yeah, yeah, voting. Yeah. Yeah, voting. voting. But here we then we see, right, the three, we have alienation as estrangement of the object of labor from labor, which is mm -hmm. fundamental, of course. And then the kinds of misrecognitions or, or, or alienations that, that come out of, as a result of that objectification of labor into commodities. The alienation of man from themselves that we misrecognize our human creative dimension uh, 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 and simply become reduced to animals you know we take meaning in the in the animal life I think which is again a very very important and serious issue these days because even you go to some of the very poor places in the United States you know you go to St. Louis or Detroit or these kinds of places, and you see the kind of poverty that exists. And there is a certain, obviously, there's a certain degree of material uh, uh, poverty, but maybe even much more fundamental, you see that people have been s simply reduced to bare life, as you say, to that animal. That what, what what's the what's there to live for? You know, the only thing that people aspire to is to consume. 
and to have some kind of you know nice place to live and you know just the, that's that's the the highest which is understandable aspiration. because you you do want to live in a yes but it's, you know, it's the kind of yeah. uh, the kind of destruction that capitalism in living in this kind of society brings that human beings become ever more reduced to their animal substructure there's no uh, 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 design. I mean, the, some people escape that, obviously, you know, and they have these creative uh, outputs. Our uh, old uh, um, uh, professor, uh, Marshall Berman, of course, was very in tune to that, the kind of creative activity that comes out of the, you know, the decay and the ghettoization and so forth that you have graffiti or you have rap music or whatever it is. There's this, you know, human spirit that comes through. Oftentimes, but that's not always the case. I mean, that's true for some, but for many others, they're simply trapped in this despair of, 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 of a, a ever more animal existence. And this is also true in the people who work. You know, why is it that factory workers turn to alcohol, for example, or other such things as a way of getting by? You know, what's the the problem is that repetition, that boredom, that you know everything becomes what what's there to live for. You know, all you have is the, the domestic and the family. So I think that's a very fundamental one. Of course, the alienation of man from society is, you know, now we've gotten to a point where people like Margaret Thatcher, and not only, I mean, that's those were the good old days at this point because the new regime, you know, these new, uh, um, I was shocked to see in our neighborhood walking, walking down the street, they have these digital signs now, the ones that, and they had a quote from Ayn Rand. Mm -hmm. okay, you know? <laughs> so well, always collected her social security check. Well, I'm sure she did, but even though it was the state, and, you know. But yeah, yeah. and Rand now, you know, is uh, <laughs> Thatcher was obviously you know a step of improvement to the kind of ideas. But Thatcher, of course, famously said, "There's no such thing as society. There's only individuals." And now that seems to have to become very much. ever more widely accepted as a principle. You know, it's interesting like to speculate, I mean, because you, you read contemporary kind of anti-capitalist struggles to create spaces, you know, like the Antifa movement, or uh, mo it's mostly like anarchist movements or who create sort of like spaces within, you know, carving out spaces that are less alienated or, you know, and in a certain way, like somebody could say, well, that's not going to, because this, what, what Marx is describing is, or Lukács, is only a problem if it's generalized, right, on the level of society itself. Yeah. It becomes the logic of functioning. So if you create smaller spaces that these kinds of relations are resisted or they're not allowed to participate, you know, kind of like a vulgar Marxist would say, well, it doesn't matter because it's still the general level will, will predominate. But I wonder, I mean, if there is a logic to it to a certain extent, if, if it's important on the, on the level of the individual, if we want to be an individualist, right, if on the level of the individual it becomes important to exercise some kind of, um, uh, what's the word, like asceticism relative to alienation relations, that in a certain sense to reduce them, you know. I used to think that's kind of a terrible idea, but now I'm thinking like maybe there's a utility to start like within these smaller groups and sort of carve these spaces as a mode of everyday life. And the, even though the general is not able to be confronted right now, but so there's an interesting question here, like between the questions of, of, of how to yeah. confront I mean, the generalized there's, there's also uh, an exchange value based an intensification because it's not only anymore the commodity form that is the source of alienation because we have in addition to that we have the screen. Mm -hmm. You know, how many of our, our of our human and you know our social interactions are mediated by the screen and which is a you know an additional Many, maybe even more uh, destructive form of, of alienation today. Mm -hmm. It's not just you go to the market and you don't see the producers or the people who ship it or anything, but you see. I mean, not, now even even more, it's you know you don't even go to the market. You go to Amazon, wherever you click, you click. and then it comes in a. It's like magic, you know. I mean, <laughs> buy with one click. Yeah, it's like magic. Things just appear then that you're. They bring you a box and you open. Them, you know, you got everything right there. So. I, in, indeed, you know, you have ever more the experience. You know, of course, that somewhere there are warehouses. We all know that. But the experience, <coughs> our lived experience, you know, this, as Althusser would say, the spontaneous ideology uh, of our society is, is very much one of, of uh, 
of detachment, alienation of us as appearing as if we are the cause of our own existence rather than we are part of this broader social network of interdependencies and, and uh, interactions and all the rest. And of course also nature, which is again increasingly an issue because more and more and more we lose sight of our relationship to the natural world, going back to your example of, of Smith and the others. Uh, you know, there's the, the fact that, I mean, Marx uh, un understood, and he was explicit, that the utility of that we have, you know, use values, are not a human creation. It's partly human. Partly it's the concrete labor that goes into making the, the coffee, let's say. Or so. But it's nature also. It's human labor mixed with nature that gives the use value to the, the exchange value is something else. And the exchange value is abstracted from the role of nature. And it just becomes an articulation of socially necessary labor time. It just becomes the expression of the, this abstracted labor that make these two things the same in that sense. You know, but in terms of utility, it's completely dependent upon, you know, we are de really dependent upon nature in, uh, in a very fundamental way. And that becomes ignored or misunderstood. I think the, the question of, of like what it's possible to do about that um, is what makes the, the fourth aspect of estrangement um, so problematic within Marxism and why it, mar it marks the early Marx as a humanist. Because if the, if the fourth aspect is, is alienation from our species being, which means like, we take the species ourselves as a biological being itself as an object right. that is also meant a means becomes a means to an end. Um, like Marx is, is number one, they're positing a species being that exists in a transcendent way that is then turned into an object, mm -hmm. which if you take that seriously, then you might you know, want to eliminate that kind of alienation and then you might become a Luddite and say, you know, let's break all these things that produce commodities in all these ways because we want to return to this essential species being that's been made into an object and that's been estranged from us. Um, where I think the, the later Marx, and, and this is Althusser's point, I think to some degree as well, um, is that we're, there is no essential species being that transcends the production of whatever it is our species being appears to be at any particular historical moment. Yeah. And accepting that opens up different kinds of possibilities for how to go through the machine rather than smash the machine towards whatever we, we can see. This, might, this was a great example of maybe so when Marx uh, rejected the metaphysical origins of, of human life uh, and maybe he pushed too hard for the human to take the place of the origin and thus creating some kind of a uh, metaphysical yeah. <laughs> centering of the human. Yeah, yeah. Which is interesting, like the, the um, uh, I've been reading a lot of Bernard Stiegler lately um, and he's an interesting answer to that because for Stiegler there is no moment of humanity where we're not already a technological being. Mm -hmm. So the point then becomes, what are we going to do with this technology, not how do we return to a romanticized yes. vision of what humans were before we were. So Stiegler would say, you know, that even the invention of writing is already like kind of a, a technical uh, uh, tool. So, you know, Heidegger, you know, hated telephones and any, he just hand wrote everything, didn't use a typewriter, but then Stiegler says, well, even handwriting, like with a pen, you know, yeah. Heidegger still participated in this. Used the he was already technologizing his his thought. Of course, you know, Heidegger probably would would have would have denied it somehow, but but it's true. Yeah. You know. But I think I think Lukács does offer an answer to this problem, which is the way he frames the role of science, which is, you know, the technology. It, it science and technology themselves are part of the process of reification. Mm -hmm. So it's not as though they're exempt from it. They're they're integrally part of the system, and they also foreclose the possibilities for consciousness. Mm -hmm. And but that, so in a, in that a way, goes, that goes th against the Marxist tradition. But there's a kind of in a in a, in a in, well, it may, but, but that's okay. <laughs> it, it, it may, but I think that is a key question. Is because there's a technology between, isn't value free. Technology is value laden and is a determining force in the historical process. Mm -hmm. So what is... But there's a difference between what Marcuse calls technoscience and science. But I'm just pointing out that Lukács right. is yeah. making clear in what we were read for today that uh, 
science, therefore technology, is part of reification. It doesn't stand outside it. So maybe it's about imagining, I don't know, a new yeah, science or a new technology. But this is an interesting point because, again, the problem may not be the, the existence of reification. The problem, I think, for Marx is the, the type of reification that exists because of the, the way the capitalist economy uh, emphasizes exchange value over use value. In, I mean, in his focus in this essay. Or maybe Lukács would have said the problem. Lukács probably did say this, I don't know, that the, 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 a socialist use or communist use of technology and science would be less reifying or something. Or, 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 you know, because, I don't know. You know, there was that element that, well, that did, our science is less reifying and yours is because it's not a reaction. And they moved it... Uh, no, I mean, the pr of course, the, the uh, contrast, if we go back to uh, what I mentioned before, the uh, thesis 11 and so forth, then is that the answer to uh, 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 alienation is objective understanding, science in that sense, you know, and as opposed to a techno science or technology, you know, more broadly, which is a, a very much an applied um, Say notion. Say that again. Objective knowledge. No, the answer to alienation is is understanding in an objective way, so you can un so you could be become a bit more immune or self aware of its effects on you. If, if we know that lived experience, that because we live in the society we live in, we're going to have these kinds of understandings of the world because we experience them in this way. A nation of us, you know, from our nature, us from our social, uh, uh, from social relations, and, and from nature, let's say, right? As, as, as he says here. That when we become aware of that process, and the kind of ideologies or the kind of alienation that is produced because we live in a world where the commodity form plays such a central role. We can't necessarily eliminate that lived experience, but we can, we can control its effects. How? By having this objective understanding of the process. The scientific, because Marx is doing science in that sense. You know, Althusser says there are three sciences, Marxism, psychoanalysis, and Mathematics. But that's already a problematic statement from another point of view. Because the moment you codify it as science, maybe he meant as an organon, as a dialectical logic. He of meant of that, you have, you, science, that you have forms of understanding that don't proceed from lived experience, but proceed from abstract categories. There's another way to think doesn't about it. Doesn't mean it's thing. right. Doesn't mean it's correct. It could be wrong. It could be. But it's objective in the sense that you're building from abstract categories as our friend Hegel and others did, rather than from lived experiences. But that, for him, is the distinction. But with Hegel, and this is something to think about, and I, 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 I'm, I'm going to cite my, my, my friends, comrades in Bulgaria who work on this. Uh, Hegelian science, uh, logic obsessed over the, the question of time. Right. In other words, the life that we live, how do we think about it in relation to the trio of past, present, and future? Right. So science, science, uh, does a very good job in, in illuminating the past that we've lived through. So for example, the Big Bang, what is gravity? You know, what is, how do we make sense of the winds if we're trying to make an airplane? So science is very, w very well sort of suited to uh, uh, exist on the continuum of our perception of the world from the past into the present and the present itself. But it's very limited in its ability to uh, imagine a future. Even though it has predictive notions, but the predictive notions that science gives us is about things that already happened in the past. We're not saying anything that, that is in conflict no, no, but, with but each creativity, other. Honestly. But creativity, I think, and this is sort of like where Marx is, I think, ag again, introduces something new. The notion of creativity is somehow to be able to, 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 um, to leave the confines of the thing that already happened, the object, right? What does it mean to be objectified? An objective reading of a situation is a, is a, is a, is a accurate reading of a situation of the present or the past, which is important. But that doesn't help you necessarily in take the leap into the, the new, right? So, so in that sense, it, objective scientific analyses are not necessarily uh, useful from the Marxist point of view of thinking about the, the everyday life. 
That's not. That's simply not true. That's simply not true. The standpoint of 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 the whole tradition, Marx especially, you know, uh, uh, the analysis was that the way you understand, right, the questions you pose, the terms of understanding themselves doesn't mean they show you what the future is or what the way, but they are necessary. It's a necessary moment. Necessary, and, but, and but not enough. Passive. There's there's more than just the objective analysis. That's necessary. Yeah, I, I, I don't disagree with that, but it's that's, not something, that's, that's but it's point. a necessary process. In other words, you can't say we're going to do scientific analysis of capitalism today and be objective about its precise form of alienation, and then we have everything we need to be able to formulate an exit from it on our own basis, on our own terms, right? It's not enough to do the Because that's only one side of the dialogue. Exactly. Yeah. In the present and the but past. But it's a necessary, specifically it's a necessary step. Yes, and it itself is also a form of intervention because once you change the categories of thinking, you also change the object itself. It's not as if it's completely detached. It's not doing. But you know, with Marx, you have to say no. You have to negate. That's the that's the way out, right? In addition to the objective knowledge of, of the object of study, the scientific knowledge, of study, you have to also add the question of the negation. That's Melville, you know. The, so to that, just to, to that word, it's probably too late to get into it because it's time. But um, what what can we talk a little bit about the negation of the negation? You um, know, it, it's the negation of the negation does not equal the original starting point, right? In that sense, which is interesting. Um, so the negation of the negation introduces the new, uh, which Hegel equates with freedom, right? So for he for Hegel, freedom is. Uh, successful discharge of the of the movement of negation of the negation in, in that sense you mean like in terms of like Hegel's origin of it or well Marx's use of it I mean you know Hegel has his agenda you know which is to paint this picture of history but what is Marx's reinterpretation of that concept um, Shall we shall we do it now or shall we reserve well, it? Well, let's, let's, let's let Pelias next, next week. Yeah, because he said, you know, I'm going to do the Hegel stuff. Oh, he said he wants to do the yeah. Hegel? Okay, so shall we start with this on sure. next Saturday? Yeah, okay. Yeah, yeah. No, I realize. Well, I just realize tell him. We tell him. also assigned this section on the critique of Hegel, right, in the yes. 1944 yes. manuscript. Yes. It was this section on strange labor then his critique of so Hegel. So the, 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 yeah, so of which Pelias assigned. Of which there's a lot of young marks because he has the critique of the philosophy of writing. Yes, he assigned the um, the critique of the Hegelian dialectic and philosophy as a whole, page 170. So maybe we'll remind Michael to immediately start, because, you know, he might start with something else, but we'll tell him to start he exactly. He told me he wanted to do the Lukács and the stuff on Hegel. Okay, so we'll start with the So Hegel. we did the estrangement, by and large. And yeah. Okay, so we'll start with the negation, with Marx's uh, uh, deployment of, of Hegelian categories in a new way. Um. And then we'll... Uh, I'm a little confused about the assignment for next week. Um, could you? It's the same as so. So the assignment is this essay from this book, *The Estranged Labor*. It's a second essay called *The Critique of the Hegelian Dialectic and Philosophy as a Whole* on 170. 170 it's to 197. Part of the manuscripts, just and it's the uh, article uh, "Reification and Constitutional Theory." Section. Section. It's, it's on the website. If you go to the website of the institute, radical imagination. And yeah, yeah, yeah. And no, Michael I'm there. Said he I'm may there. also I'm just, just email, clarifying. Oh, send out an email with chapter one of Porsche's. Uh, what is okay, so you're in this here. Those two Sorry? books. The Lukács and the, the Lukács is page. Yeah. Is 